Hi guys, so this is a bit of a new setup. I'm trying something new today. I'm gonna to try and go through and help you understand why sometimes you just have like random symptoms and you can't correlate it to anything. I'm doing this, well, primarily on behalf of one of my clients. She's having this, this issue where she's getting these symptoms that come up inconsistently and she can't understand why, can't piece them together. But this is something that I think a lot of people would find a lot of insight from. So I wanted to, to do it live so that everybody could get some benefit from it as well. What's happening here is, so, I'm, I'm talking about it from the perspective of my clients because it's going to make it more understandable and relatable and it's actually going to help them. But you can, you can apply this to your situation too. So what's going on with Rita is she gets these, these random symptoms that she can't piece to anything. Like she'll have a good day one day and a bad day the next. And it's not correlated directly to her doing anything different in her protocol. So to give you a bit of backstory, she's in a really tricky place. She's very sensitive to lots of different things. She's in a very poor state of health and it's she's very intolerant to lots of things. And... The things she is tolerant to, she's only tolerant to a very, very tiny, tiny amount. So a good example is two of the things that she's reacting to the most are probiotics and digestive enzymes. And the reason is we're going to get to here. When we have these, these random symptoms that we can't piece together, this is because, so as you can see here, we've got this cup. This cup sort of represents our, our liver's capacity to function. This, this, like up to this top limit here, this is how much the liver can do. If, what, if anything we do pushes us over this limit, we come down here and we've got random symptoms. And these, these depend on whatever environmental toxin or whatever, so genetics can come into it here. You can have genetic predispositions to certain things. It really depends on the individual case. But what's going on is your liver has run out of space to handle all these things. So we've got at the bottom daily requirements, metabolism. So this is just like the basic things your liver does to keep you alive. So this is recycling neurotransmitters, creating cholesterol out of saturated fat, um, making enzymes, like your liver does so much different stuff and this takes up a lot. This is like literally like nearly half of it already. And then we've got environmental toxins. So this is just environmental toxins from, from like exogenously, from externally. So this could be, if you've got mold, some mold in your house, that could be that. Say you wash your hands with washing up liquid, that's an environmental toxin that your body has to cleanse. All of these things add extra load to the, to the liver. Then you've got digestion as well. So the liver's role in digestion is creating bile to absorb fats, and it also absorbs, like everything that comes in from the digestion goes through the liver before it reaches the bloodstream. So digestion obviously takes a lot of work. Say for example, in Rita's case, your digestion is already impaired. So after your second meal, you're at this level, but then you have your third meal and you're up here. Then you have your fourth meal and you're up here. And then you start getting symptoms and you didn't, it doesn't look like you did anything. It doesn't look like you changed anything. But even the fact that you've just done this digestion means you're, you're now coming over into overspill. Your liver can't handle and then you get symptoms. So this could be things like histamine intolerance symptoms. So itching. I know that's something Rita really struggles with. So things like itching can, can come out once you reach this point. Or this is where if you've got skin problems, your so as, as we said, environmental toxins, your liver is processing all of your fat soluble toxins in, in your environment, in your diet, from your gut, all of these different places. So say you're doing something that's increasing the amount of toxins that's coming in. So I've got a little rubber here as well, so I can rub this out. So say Rita didn't have any extra food, but instead she did some probiotics. So the thing with taking probiotics is they're living. They're a living organism. So even if you take probiotics today, and they're creating like a Herxheimer reaction. So this, these probiotics are causing more environmental toxins. Even if you took these probiotics five days ago, they're living, they live inside you, they colonize you. And while they don't produce toxins themselves, they fight with any dysbiotic organisms you have inside your gut. And this means that like, say even five days after you've taken them, they're still going and the, the warfare is still happening. These bacteria are still dying. It could be yeast, it could be viruses, it could be whatever. So it's making this environmental toxins come up and up and up. So your environmental toxin load is so much that even the fact that, so, so you're already full here. And then say you have your extra meal. So now you're up here. This is where your extra meal is. This extra meal can't fit in the cup. It comes out and now you've got symptoms. And it doesn't look like you did anything wrong. It looks like everything's fine because you didn't take more probiotics today. You didn't increase your digestive enzymes. You didn't do anything. The thing is, you've still got this carry on from yesterday. The probiotics are still here. And this is why we can't just do probiotics like crazy. We can't just go in. We have to go slow because every time we, we, we overfill this cup, 
Not only is it really uncomfortable, we get all of those different kinds of symptoms that we, want to, that we would rather avoid, and we create a backlog. So when the body's in a backlog, it's still got to be dealing with all of this. The liver's already struggling. So then it has to prioritize what it wants to do. So it could look like toxins not becoming detoxified and antioxidants not being bound to these toxins, which means you create reactive oxygen cascade all the way through your body, which cause things like anxiety. And it, it makes it so that your body has more work to catch up on in the long run. So then we can only increase the probiotics and the other things that fill this cup up even more slowly. So it's really important that we try to stay within this little range here. Like this is the maximum range. If we go over this, we've done too much. So the approach is to try and keep within this cup. The other example that I wanted to talk about was with, with one of my other clients, Gillian. She's struggling with, with a few of these things as well. And she notices that, that her symptoms are different. So when this cup is filled in her case and the liver cannot handle anymore, her symptoms that, that express are things like fatigue, anxiety, so it doesn't particularly matter what the symptoms are. It's just once this is overflowed, you get symptoms. And these are the symptoms that you, that you like classically have in your illness that, that kind of come and go. Now you can kind of understand why. It's about keeping this cup less full. So anything that we can do that supports the liver or supports this, this cup's ability to empty itself. So you can imagine this cup has got a little hole down here. So this cup is always draining. There's always some coming out. So the cup's always, because your liver is always working. Anything we can do that makes this hole bigger means more stuff can come out, which means we can empty it quicker, which means we feel less of these symptoms of it overflowing. We get symptoms when it's overflowing out here. If we can support it down here so that it doesn't overflow, this is how it naturally drains, we don't get any symptoms and we feel better. So things that help this are, so first of all, the best thing you can do to help, help, the, help this drain is to make sure you're putting as little in the top as possible. So if you can remove half of your environmental toxins, so you can cut that in half, half of this is gone, which means this little bit that would normally give you symptoms can now fit in the cup and it doesn't give you symptoms, which means we can focus more on probiotics, which this is, this is the biggest problem. A lot of the time, the, the toxins are coming from the gut. And the only way we can stop the toxins coming from the gut is by healing the gut, healing the gut lining and restoring the microbiome that we should have there. Because the ones that are there that shouldn't be there are what are causing these toxins. So as we gradually do this and we restore the probiotics, it reduces the amount of toxins that are coming from the gut itself, which means we can handle more probiotics. And then we get in this cascade where everything's speeding up really nicely. Other things that you can do that support, so first, so first of all, re reduce the amount of things that you're putting in here. So less toxins is good. Obviously we can't just sort the microbiome out overnight, but you can like put less, like don't put deodorant on, like it's, it's chemicals. Don't um, like drink fluoride and chlorinated water. Don't take artificial sweeteners. Like reduce your exposure from toxins from the outside. It's less work for your liver to do. It's less work for your body's overall metabolism. So that frees up some space. When it comes to digestion, we can make sure that we're eating foods that are really pre-digested because they're gonna take less work for our body to absorb those things. So a good example is um, like coconut oil is really good because it's 50% medium chain triglycerides. They're a type of fat that doesn't require bile to be um, absorbed and digested. So we can get all of the nutrients from the coconut oil or from half of it with way less digestive power. So it takes so the digestion, we're trying to bring it down so it's only here instead of there. And even this little bit of difference can, can, can really make the change if you're like up here. Like you can really see the symptom resolution just from that little, that little tiny gap. Another big one with digestion is if you've got um, these kinds of dysbiosis going on and you're fermenting. So a good example is like if you're eating high FODMAP and you're eating um, lots of carbs and you're just fermenting all of these things, First of all, they don't actually digest properly. You don't absorb them the way that you think you do. What's happening is they're, they're being fermented by different microbes in your gut that produce endotoxins. So instead of actually giving you digestion and making you like nourished, you're just adding to this toxin load. So it's really about optimizing what you're eating so that you're 
so that when you do work to digest your food, it's actually food that's like super easily digestible and has lots of nutrients in it, and also is very specifically not going to feed these pathogenic organisms that will then increase the toxins, because then you can get these kinds of symptoms. So when I've got toxins here, this can even be things like histamine. So the primary way that we degrade histamine in our body is, oh, I don't know how to draw diagrams for this. So this is, this is like the, the teething process, I don't know. So, so we've got two main pathways. We've got DAO, we've got DAO, and we've got HNMT. So these are the two processes that break down histamine. So this one, DAO, stands for diamine oxidase. This is an enzyme that's present on the, the lumen, the, the one cell layer thick in the layer in the small intestine. And when our gut's damaged, so if you've got leaky gut or you've got any kind of gut symptom, you're gonna have a deficiency of DAO because the gut's damaged. It doesn't have as much surface area, it doesn't have as much DAO. So this is already gonna be reduced. So you've got reduced DAO, but then what often happens is the gut is damaged because you have a dysbiosis. So you'll know that you've got dysbiosis if you've got bloating gas, intolerance to certain vegetables, these kinds of things. So what's happening is, say you eat starch, for example, it comes in, this dysbiosis here eats it and it produces histamine as a byproduct. So that means you've got extra histamine coming in your body. So this is histamine filling this cup up. And then you've got reduced DAO in the gut, which means it's not being broken down, which means you're absorbing more. So that's more histamine in the cup. And in this cup, the only way we can get histamine out of this cup, we can't use DAO. DAO only works in the gut. This, HNMT, works in the liver. So any extra histamine that we've created and absorbed in our gut and we haven't been able to degrade, gets absorbed. And we can only get rid of it with HNMT, histamine and methyltransferase. So this is um, like the secondary, the secondary way that we process histamine in our body. It's, it's like the backup system. This is meant to do like 80% of the work. And this is meant to do 20% of the work. So this is more about endogenous histamine. So we produce histamine ourselves as a neurotransmitter. We use it to produce stomach acid. We do loads of different things. So it's important, but this pathway isn't meant to handle all of this. So as I was saying before, the best thing we can do to help here is to stop putting stuff in the cup. So if we can um, improve the amount of DAO in the gut here, so we improve the amount, so that's by fixing the lining, and we improve the dysbiosis. So we get rid of the organisms like candida and certain yeasts or other organisms that are producing histamine and replace them with ones that degrade histamine and that heal the gut lining so that we, we can produce DAO. We'll have 80% less going into this bucket here, which means HNMT doesn't have to focus on this so much. But this, doing this takes time. This requires like an intensive protocol where you're eating the right foods and you're supporting the five pillars. I've got another video on that if you wanna go and look at it. Just go in my group, look up the five pillars. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this kind of thing with that as well, so keep an eye out for that. We can focus to heal this in the long run, but in the short run, this is how we can get relief from symptoms. Because we only get histamine intolerance symptoms when this cup is overloaded. So what can we do to support this pathway to give you symptom relief? Well, firstly, anything that supports methylation will be helpful. Uh, methylation is um, a process that, our, that all of the cells in our body do. We use it a lot in our liver. It's how we process lots of toxins. As you can hear from this name. So this stands for histamine N-methyltransferase. So it's an enzyme that uses methylation to break down histamine. So when we boost methylation, we support this, which means it's able to do. So this 20% that, it, that it's meant to do, it can only do if you have enough methyl donuts and if you've got enough like methylation capacity. So supporting methylation will do that. Secondly, anything that reduces this is gonna help with this. So if you can, you can't really reduce your daily requirement for metabolism. You can't really reduce the amount of toxins that you've got if you're already doing everything as cleanly as you can. Anything that reduces this will be super helpful. So things that are really great for this, juicing, Juicing is good because, first of all, it provides lots of methyl donors. So I like juicing kale. kale. Juicing kale is pretty much the highest source of methyl donors you're gonna get. You could also blend raw liver if you like that. I don't think many people will be interested in that. So juicing is probably the way to go there. So that will support it a lot. You also give yourself lots of, 
like magnesium, potassium, other minerals that are cofactors in reactions that process histamine and get it out. And it's not just about this. They will help with toxins. It will help with your daily metabolism, which all reduce the thing, which means you have more space for histamine in this cup. Um, other things that will support this are, so we've got juicing. And juicing is good as well because of the enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts that speed up reactions. What, what this is going to do is make this really, really big. It's going to make this hole really big. So your liver is like functioning like crazy and it's able to pour all of this stuff out and it's able to keep up with your daily metabolism and process toxins and do all of these things really quickly. It speeds up a lot of reactions. The biggest thing is just reduce the workload of the liver. If you reduce the workload of the liver, it picks up the slack wherever is necessary. So anything we can do to reduce the workload on the liver is great. One of my, one of my favorites is coffee enemas. Coffee enemas, fantastic. So I always recommend that you, you use juicing if you're gonna do coffee enemas. And the reason coffee enemas are so good is, first of all, they support methylation, and they also increase the antioxidant capacity in the, in the liver and in the lumen of the small intestine as well. So doing coffee enemas not only helps with liver function, but it also helps to get the small intestine functioning properly again. It increases an enzyme called glutathione reductase by about 900%, which is not insignificant. So this is the enzyme that recycles glutathione. Using this approach, we increase the antioxidant capacity in the body, which means toxins are going to take less space up over here. Um, digestion is going to be um, improved because it's stimulating the body to create and produce new bile. So the digestion is going to take less because bile is already ready to go. And it's, it speeds up your metabolism quite a lot. So it, it's actually, in effect, you've still got the same amount here, but it's going to reduce the size of this to down here. But you've got to remember, this is still the same amount of work. Even though you've squidged it into a smaller space, it's still the same amount of work and it's still going to burn the same amount of nutrients. So we need to make sure that we've got methylation support and we've got juicing as cofactors to this. Otherwise, you, you get to a place where it's kind of like you're in a car, you're accelerating full speed, but you've also got the brake on, you're out of engine oil, you're out of brake fluid. It's like you're just sort of destroying the car. You're not actually speeding it up. So that's why it's important we do all of these other things first. So we need to make sure we've got a good microbiome reduce the dysbiosis as much as possible, support methylation and do juicing and provide our body with lots of nutrients. So as you can see, it's, it's fairly complicated and it's also fairly simple at the same time because one thing doesn't, it, it's like one plus one equals two, but you can't see like the equation's happening tomorrow instead of today. And that's why you're getting the reaction now. So something that you've done yesterday can be affecting you today. So I was doing this mostly to help Rita out. So I'm gonna give her a little bit more explanation here. So two of the things over here, that, that are three of the things that are taking up the most for, for Rita personally are digestion and probiotics and enzymes. So this is what's up here. So at the minute, Rita is having trouble increasing her doses because everything she does just pushes her out of this, out of this range. So she did probiotics say three days ago and then she takes, so she's doing, so she's got my, my the, the enzymes that I suggest, Lipo Gold. She's got one capsule and she's sprinkling out one thirty second of a capsule, which is a tiny, tiny amount. And before she does it, like, it, it's okay. But then you put the enzyme in and then this enzyme has now pushed you over. And even though you did the en you've been doing the enzyme every single day and it doesn't give you problems, the thing is today, your cup is more full. Your liver is processing the increased amount of fat that we're putting in, she's increasing her diet to not just have chicken breast, but chicken thigh. So that's increasing, increasing the fat intake. So this puts more, more tax on the liver because the liver's now had to up its daily requirement for digestion to create new bile. But this is really important because bile is how toxins come out. So it's reducing this one a little bit, increasing this one a little bit. But then the probiotics are creating loads of toxins because she's got a severe dysbiosis. So she's taken the probiotics and this has pushed her up here. So even though she took these three or four days ago, they're still taking this much extra space. It's getting smaller every day, but it's still enough that the, the, the enzyme and the food is pushing her over. So even though she feels like she's doing everything right, this is why she's still getting random symptoms. And this, this can happen. This can be fatigue, this can be anxiety. This can be really anything. This could look like um, skin problems a lot of the time, so hives. Hives is almost always when this capacity has been reached and you're having this kind of thing. It can look like joint pain, it can look like arthritis. There's, there's, there's basically no limit to what can happen when we've pushed our body past its capacity to, to process basically everything in the environment. Because this is, this is liver load. 
And as, as, I, as I say all the time, the liver is involved in almost any process in the whole body. Neurotransmitter metabolism, um, creation and degradation of lots of different types of hormones. It creates cholesterol, out saturated fat. It's processing every single piece of food that comes into your body. Every single toxin is going through your liver. So you can imagine all of these things build this load up and they can easily overload it. So if we can do anything to support any of those things, it's gonna help and we'll have less symptoms. Joy Pasillas, during taking antibiotics and antifungals, are probiotics effective and recommended? So it's very difficult for me to say this without actually working with you because in my opinion, yes, probiotics are necessary at every stage of this kind of, of healing journey because it's not the antibiotics that heal us, it's the balance that the antibiotics can bring. And we won't restore balance if we just nuke everything and don't put the things that are meant to be there back in. So they are important, but if you haven't supported those other five pillars, so at the minute we're talking about the liver load and this is really tied into bile, but we can also talk about stomach acid, we can talk about digestive enzymes, we can talk about motility and mucosa and probiotics. They are one of the pillars themselves. So if we don't have all of those things sorted, putting probi probiotics in can lead to things like um, overgrowth and other kinds of dysbiosis. So they are very important, but you really do have to work with somebody to make sure that your body's ready for them at that stage. One little trick you could do is try using suppositories. So you can put them basically up your butt, straight into your colon, which is where we really need them. Even in the colon, they're still having significant effects on like the motility and the gastric secretions higher up in the digestive tract. So by doing that, we, we get all of the benefits and we don't get any of the risks of like overgrowth. So Multi Patel, how do you increase your DAO? Hi Multi, I want to talk with you soon. Um, how do we increase our DAO? So DAO is an enzyme that we naturally produce in the lumen of our small intestine. So as I've got out here, if you fix the gut, and you heal that intestinal lining, you'll start producing DAO again. But it's not just about increasing DAO, it's about reducing the amount of histamine that's being produced in the gut. So we have to resolve the dysbiosis and heal the gut, and both of those together, it reduces the amount of histamine coming from the gut, and it improves the gut's ability to process the, the histamine, which means this pathway doesn't have to do it. I, I was talking with, um, with Multi on a call recently, and I was explaining to her how we can basically get a resolution from the histamine intolerance symptoms basically overnight or within two days. And that's because all we do is we optimize all of these things so that this cup isn't overflowing anymore. As soon as this isn't overflowing, all of these random symptoms, they're gone. It's not res resolution in the long run, but just symptom relief is it's really good. It makes, it makes the journey for healing so much easier, so much more bearable. And this is something I struggled with. So I've still not reached the point where my histamine is, is fixed. Like I haven't, I haven't resolved it, but I haven't had my histamine level come above my liver load. So it's stayed under here for probably the last two years now, maybe a year and a half, two years, which means like I don't get any of the histamine symptoms that I used to get. So for me, histamine intolerance looked like really bad gut pain. Um, I'd get this extremely severe stabbing pain in my eyes. They get all watery and itchy. I would be like, restlessly anxious. I would get suicidal level depression like I felt like I had to kill myself immediately. And it's a chemical thing. It's because my liver was, it wasn't able to process. So I had toxins going through my brain. I had histamine, which is a neurotransmitter, overloading my brain and it couldn't handle with it. So it sends me these chemical signals, like something's wrong, this isn't okay. Siv McPhee, fantastic and in-depth explanations of this. Thank you, thank you, yeah. I got this in detail, so. Any, question, any more questions, let me know. How can, we how can we reduce dysbiosis? So the most important thing when it comes to reducing dysbiosis is so let me write this down. So this, because we've got it up here as well. So I'll go into this in a bit more detail. So how do we reduce dysbiosis? First of all, we have to eat food we can actually digest. So the biggest, the biggest thing here is, is usually starches. If your gut is damaged up here, your gut's damaged, you don't have the enzyme present in your gut that breaks starch all the way down to a monosaccharide, which means all of these things basically just end up feeding pathogens, which gets stuck up here. So you eat food that you can't digest, which means you damage your gut, which means you can't digest it, which means you damage your gut, so you get stuck in this cycle. So cutting these foods out and only eating foods that you're actually able to digest is the first step. It's very individual though. You have to, yeah, do I like the GAPS diet? Yeah, that's a very good approach because GAPS is just basically eliminating 
all starches and more difficult to digest foods. Secondly, we have to support the five pillars. So, as I said, five pillars, stomach acid, enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa, and the probiotics that live on the mucosa. We have to, we, we, like you, if you've got some kind of gut symptom, it's down to this. It's one of these five pillars, and we need to figure out which one it is and support it. In many people's cases, it's one, it's two, it's three, it's all five. In my case, it's all five, and I'm seeing people with all five way more often, and it's really, it's really difficult because you have to bring them all back up at the same time, and it's really tricky. Um, probiotics are essential. So, first of all, with, with this five pillars, we're, we're bringing stomach acid, enzymes, and bile back. These are the body's natural antimicrobial mechanisms that keep the flora in balance. So that helps to address the dysbiosis from like a killing perspective. This is what people who are doing oregano protocols or antibiotics, antifungals, all of these things are trying to achieve. They're trying to mimic the role that the body does normally by itself. Like a healthy person can drink three or four glasses of kefir and they don't get an overgrowth. That's like a quadrillion different types of bacteria with millions of, C trillion, quadrillions of CFUs. So it's absolutely a huge amount and they don't get overgrowth. Why? Because their five pillars are intact. If these things are intact, you won't get these other problems. So supporting these is the most important thing. And probiotics are part of this. Because, so the last pillar is the gut, the gut lining. So this is the gut lining, the gut lining. And this is, the repair of this is regulated by probiotics. If you don't have the right gut flora in your gut, you cannot repair your gut lining. It's just not possible. They literally tell the gut how to repair itself. There's really no nego negotiation there, but you have to make sure that they're supported through like the bile and the, the acid and the enzymes, or these probiotics can then become problematic because they can grow in the intestine where we don't want them. And that's really tricky. Sheila, what makes a good probiotic? So I've got one probiotic personally that I recommend. I'm, I was an affiliate, I'm not. I still recommend them. The thing is, they're the best, in my opinion, they're the best probiotic. They're, anything from the brand called Custom Probiotics is really great. Um, I really like them because they're, they don't have any fillers. They've got no, like not even cellulose. So people that are sensitive to plants, like it's, there's nothing. It's just probiotic powder, that's it. And they're a, a, a strongly therapeutic dose. They're like 250, 260 billion CFUs per bottle, which is, no, per scoop, per scoop, per serving. And like, as far as CFUs per amount of money it costs, these are by far the most cost-effective probiotics you'll ever find. They're a bit more expensive as an upfront cost. I think the smaller bottle is about 120 pounds. So $120 maybe. So it's more of an upfront cost, but it's definitely worth the investment. You want a probiotic that's colonizing. So things like um, Saccharomyces boulardii or any kind of spore-based probiotic, these can help regulate dysbiosis, but they're not colonizing, which means they're not gonna inhabit your gut. So really we need to bring the balance back. We need to put the organisms in there that we've killed off with antibiotics, with a bad diet, with all of these pesticides and all of these different things. We need to bring these back. And custom probiotics, I really like them because they've got two different um, options. There's, there's one that's delactate free, which is very well tolerated by people with histamine intolerance. And the second one is an 11 strain formula. And it's like, even still, I, I still have problems with histamine. I, I, I won't lie. I mean, you can clearly see, I understand it pretty well. So I know what's going on but it takes time to heal. Like your gut doesn't just heal overnight. So I'm still struggling. I'm, st I'm still on this stage, but I've managed to get past this stage. So I don't have any of that anymore. And even still the other probiotics that I like, their 11 strain formula has got, it, I tolerate it well. And I was sensitive to delactate, like with a chronic fatigue background and with histamine, with my histamine symptoms, but I'm fine with that now. So that's the one that I would go for if these symptoms aren't such a big deal. But if you do definitely have histamine intolerance, you want to go with the with the with the lower one. Um, anyone that wants links to these, I'll put them in the post live as like a post live edit, and just comment below, and I can send you a, a link to them too. More questions. Do you like tests like CDSA 2.0 to check levels of various bacteria in the gut? So, when it comes to bacteria in the gut, I don't like any kind of testing like um, stool tests, and I don't find them to be very very helpful if I'm honest. Um, a more helpful sort of conventional test would be an organic acids urine test because then we're measuring the metabolites of what's happening in the gut, not just what we can see in the stool. So when we look in the stool, 
Um, first of all, anything that you poop out that's an anaerobic organism is already dead as soon as it comes out. Like, as soon as it's exposed to oxygen, it's dead. So we lose half the stuff that's in there. Half the stuff's not even documented. And it doesn't really give you a picture of what's going in the small intestine, which is usually, like, if, you've, if you're struggling with histamine intolerance, this is a, a small intestinal problem. It's not, it's not in the colon. And really what you're seeing in a stool test is the colon. So when you do an organic acids test, you're seeing the metabolism of what's happening in the gut. So if you're getting lots of fermentation going on in the gut, the gut bugs are producing these different metabolites that come in through the leaky gut. They're processed and excreted in the urine, and we're measuring those. That can be, that can be helpful, but, and, and, and it really can. So a good example is, uh, I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of people recently, so I think Malta is still here, this was you included, you've got um, very high arabinose and very low vitamin C. And this is something that I'm seeing a lot. And this is because the arabinose is like a fungal biomarker. So it's saying that there's a, a tendency towards fungal dysbiosis. And when your vitamin C is really low, it means your antioxidant status in your body is completely depleted. There's no, your body can't keep up with the oxidative stress anymore. So you're not excreting hardly any vitamin C because you've just run out of, of antioxidants. When you've depleted all of that, it, it shows up on that test. So you can get some, you can get some insight it's, it, it can be valuable. If I would go for anything like conventional, it would be an organic acid urine test. Um, another good one is um, 23andMe genetic report. So that can be like, the reason I like that one is all other tests are basically just a snapshot in time. This one, you've got it, you've got it for life. It's your genetics. They don't change. They're not like a snapshot. They're okay. They do change, but you have to get hit by like uh, an X-ray from space or something. Like, it's very unlikely that your genetics will change. So that report, you've got it, and then we can use that going on. So that's really cool. And you can, like, you can use 23andMe, you can get a genetic report for like, say, 80 pounds. You can put it into programs like Genetic Genie and other places online, Promethean, and they give you like a full report and explain like what all of the different things mean. And if you need any help with that, just let me know. I, I explain people's reports and stuff for free. So just give me a heads up if you need help with that. I'll help you understand like what's going on with your report and, and let you know. With testing, I like to use bioresonance. Bioresonance is really cool because it's not just testing what's in the gut. It's testing what the body doesn't like in the gut or in the whole body. This is, I'm gonna put the pen down because I don't think I can really, could I write, can I draw this? I'm trying to, I'm trying to get used to this new. Okay, I, what I can do is I can draw something. This is, this is gonna help. I know, I'm not a very good artist, so <laughs> you might have to give me a minute. Trust me, this is gonna help. It will help you understand a concept. Okay, so this is, this is really, this is a terrible drawing. I promise I'll get better. This is my first time doing this, so don't hate on me too much. So this is, this is your heart rate. And you can see the distance between here and here is say one. The distance between here and here is say 1.8. The distance between here and here is back down to say 1.2. So what you've got here is a difference in variability in heart rate. So this is measured to your stress response in your body. As the variability, so you see here the difference is 0.8, and then the difference here is 0.6. So there's quite a high range of variability. But say when you're stressed, your body is sort of like, oh, I'm so bad at drawing these. <laughs> so it's like there's, there's almost no variance. So the difference here is one, one from the last beat is one. So there's no variance. When you're here, your body's in a stress state. So when we do bioresonance, we, there's a whole database of different frequencies that have been um, catalogued to being like connected to specific organisms. So say for example, Candida albicans or Lyme's disease or Epstein-Barr, all of these E. coli, like it doesn't matter what it is, it's been documented. So we run this frequency, like this whole database of frequencies through your body and your heart rate variability changes based on the frequencies. So if it's a frequency that, is, that your body's okay with, you'll keep having quite a high variability in your heart rate. But say you, say you run a frequency like frequency 5000 and it kills candida and candida albicans, for example, is really what the problem is. So maybe, maybe we should use a different example because candida albicans comes up on stool tests a lot or in organic acids tests as being the problem. But say 
the candida has overgrown because of some other kind of dysbiosis. There's another organism in the gut which has made this proliferate. So say there's some E. coli in there, and this isn't something that comes up as often, but this is something that, that I've scanned myself for and I had, to I had a problem with. So I would run the E. coli frequency, which would kill that, that microorganism, and my heart rate vari variability comes down, which says stress response, which means my body says, this is a stressful organism for us and we need to kill this. And then the beauty of it is, once you've figured out which is stressful, the machine will, pr will like make a graded program for you of what's the most stressful organisms. So you'll have like, so for me, I'll give you my example. So it's like Lyme's disease, Epstein-Barr, and E. coli. So these three things come up, and now I know these are my big problems. I know my body's saying, we kill these things and we get healthy. So I kill those things, and well, Killing these things, we go back into here. Killing these things, they don't like it. They produce a lot of toxins. They make me feel awful. They give me depression, fatigue, all these different things. But this is what's so important about this approach. You kill these things in this cup. So you kill it in this range so that your toxin load doesn't come out of this cup. If it does, you get symptoms. If it doesn't, you still feel fine. Like I've, I use the rife machine today. Let me know. And we do uh, like a discovery call. I call it my root cause analysis. So I like to, so you send me basically everything you've got, all your tests, like a food diary, um, any information that you, you can think would be helpful. You send it all over to me and we book a call and I talk to you like, this is totally free. No, like there's no like, hidden costs, it's, it's free. So we just, we talk on the phone, I get to understand your case, your symptoms. If I think I can help you, which I mean, if you're, if you're still here, if all of this is something you can relate to, I can already tell you I can help you. It's, this, is, this is a maze that it's taken me like, fifth, like, like three years to be able to navigate. So yeah, it's, um, it's taken me a while to pick up all this knowledge. So if you've got any of this, yeah, I can, I can help you. But I'd like to make sure that we're a good fit before I say, yeah, we'll do some coaching. But yeah, I do I do, do paid consultations. So if you're interested, um, just let me know um, and we'll do a free call and see, see how I can help you. Hi, Nan. Hi, Jan Gregory. Hello, Nan. Um, Aline. Very interesting, yeah, really cool. I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Let me just check the, what I called the video. Histamine intolerance, heart time reactions, liver congestion support. Yep, pretty much covered everything. So if you like this kind of thing with, with like lessons like this, explaining everything, let me know what topics you want me to cover and I'll do exactly the same thing. I'm probably gonna do something about the five pillars and digestion and optimizing the gut and all of those things, but anything you're interested in, just let me know and we'll do all of this. Uh, so I'll talk to you soon guys. Thank you for coming. If you liked it, please like it. It really helps. It helps me. It helps the algorithm. The more people see it, the more people can help and share it as well. That really helps. This, is, this isn't information that you find really anywhere and you won't find someone that can explain it with this level of detail. So if you can share this in like histamine intolerance groups or like, like probiotics groups, Herxheimer groups, anything like that, that will help these people understand because my, like my, my, my mission statement is to reduce unnecessary suffering. And like people out here with just having these random symptoms and they don't know why, and I can just, you can send them this video and they'll be like, oh, okay, I can, don't have to suffer anymore. It will be so helpful. So if you know anyone that's struggling with anything like this, send it to them. If you know groups where this would be appreciated, please share it in there as well. I'd really appreciate it. So any more questions, just let me know. Send me a message, give me an inbox. If I can help you in any way, please just let me know. Um, thank you for coming. And like I said, please like it. See you.